Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Dr. Meg Lohman is known affectionately throughout the world as Canopy Meg. She is one of the world's foremost scientists in the area of what Meg calls the Earth's eighth continent. She is a tireless educator and Meg has a passion around the opportunity to explore, research and conserve our global forests. She's a mentor to the next generation of scientists and young women and girls and minorities. And she loves talking about the sustainability of forests through good stewardship. She's a wonderful storyteller and advisor. And Meg, thanks for being with me on the Storyteller Microphone today. Absolutely, what a pleasure. And I'm so happy to talk about my favorite subject, trees. Well, you introduced me to a word that I had never heard before, which is an arbonaut. Tell us what that means. Sure, you know, Grace, astronauts explore outer space. Aquanauts came to be in the 1950s when we invented scuba, and those are explorers of undersea. And so Arbornauts came into existence in the 1980s when I um, pioneered some methods to climb trees and explore what lives up there. So technically an Arbornaut is a treetop explorer. And what I've learned through you is that we actually went to the moon and back before we were in the tops of the trees. Is that right? It's amazing. Foresters studied trees for hundreds of years from the ground. They looked at things. They only saw the top of a tree or the whole tree when they cut it down. And uh, I wrote a book, it's called The Arbornaut for that very reason, because I wanted people to say, wow, here's a brand new part of the planet that we never explored until the 1980s and 90s. And it's obviously really, really important to keeping us alive. So it's crazy, isn't it, that we overlook this? It's it's mind boggling now to think that we went to the moon and we never went to the top of the trees. <laughs> so you call this the eighth continent. Tell us why. I call it that because in some ways I felt like Christopher Columbus when I first climbed a tree in 1979 is one of the first people to explore it scientifically, not just climb up to trim branches or prepare to cut it down. And it was another continent. You know, half of the species in the land component of our planet live in the top of a tree. That's an enormous number, millions and millions of things are up there. And to think that we overlooked it and many are right in our own backyards is kind of hard to believe. So it is in a sense, exploring a whole new world, which is akin to a new continent. So it's not just the trees. We should talk about, first let's talk about the trees and why they're so important. But then let's talk about what we find in the trees. Sure, we can do all of the above. And, uh, you know, I guess we have to start with the fact that I was a crazy graduate student. I wanted to study leaves because I grew up in the northeast of US where trees change color and the leaves fall off the trees for six months. And I couldn't believe when I heard that tropical rainforests keep their leaves all year round. There's 75% of the species on the planet that are like tropical trees, not colorful temperate trees. And all of a sudden I realized, holy cow, we had no idea what was going on up there. So I was passionate about trying to get a method. I uh, welded a slingshot. It's in the university's machinery shop. And I sewed a harness with a uh, seatbelt webbing. And lo and behold, I used the slingshot to hoist a rope over a branch and go up the tree. And that was the beginning of the world of Arbornauts, which is kind of crazy. And once I was up there, there was everything there. Of course, that's where all the flowers are and the leaves and the fruits. And so it's no surprise that all the insects are up there and the birds eating the insects and the lizards eating the insects. So it is this hot spot for critters. And so you went from shy girl if I remember correctly from reading the Arbonaut, you went from shy got girl to like slingshotting yourself into the trees. Really? <laughs> I was such a geek and I never dared even raise my hand in class. And 
I was trampled in college in a way because I didn't really stand up for myself. But um, I speak for the trees. I still have my moments of shyness, but I did um, end up discovering a new science, which I think is just why I wrote the book, because I wanted to remind young girls as well as boys that, you know what, discovery is still all around us. It's really possible to do something new if you just have the passion and the creativity. It doesn't really require a budget of millions of dollars or growing up in the most sophisticated schools in the world. You just have to maybe get out there and ask questions. How did you know that you had discovered a new science? I didn't. I just kept bumbling along and I thought, oh my gosh, here's the home for a lot of biodiversity. And then I thought, oh my gosh, here's where a lot of the photosynthesis is going on. You know, here's where the carbon storage is happening and here's where the climate interfaces with the trees. So all these things kept adding on, like building a wall almost to remind us of the importance of trees. And it wasn't until about the 1990s after I had developed canopy walkways as well as ropes and harnesses and um, joined some French compatriots to use hot air balloons to work in the canopy that I hosted the world's first international canopy conference. And we all realized that we were on the cutting edge of a very new way of looking at trees and forests. So what happens next? You say our science is, do we actually call your science canopy science? What do we call your science? We, everyone calls it canopy science. There are ca canopy science proceedings. There are articles in journals which list that as the topic. And there's a growing volume of literature, but relatively little compared to the importance of trees. It is very, very understudied and under budgeted. And, you know, the budget of NASA is probably a zillion times bigger than the budget for studying the tops of trees. And yet trees keep us alive. So it's a pretty crazy discrepancy. Where does most of your funding come from then? Oh, sweat and toil and <laughs> flying economy and doing everything as cheaply as I can. But National Geographic has funded me. Um, the National Science Foundation funds those of us who are still involved with uh, research institutions, which I no longer am. And um, so they've been generous. The European Science Foundation funds a lot of research. Europeans fund much more tropical rainforest research than Americans as a whole. And um, of course, in my beginning days as an Australian, I got funding from Australian foundations, which was great when I was a student. When I think of myself, I can say that, yes, we need to be concerned about the climate. We need to be concerned about the trees. But how do you build a sense of urgency in some people who, you know, may live in a city and not be, feel particularly connected? To the I trees? wish I knew the answer to that, because obviously the best uh, way to combat climate change is trees, to save big trees. And Florida's an embarrassing situation where we're not doing a very good job with that. They not only shade you and lower the temperature, but they store the carbon that we pollute the air with and they keep uh, runoff from occurring uh, because their roots are fantastic and they obviously cleanse polluted water when it comes through the canopy, as well as house pollinators and all kinds of medicinal uh, organisms and all kinds of important uh, animals that are key to the health of the planet. So that's hugely, hugely important, but it's a giant effort for me to get funding to save forests. Right now I'm trying to save the last 3% of forests in Madagascar, which is just so dire and the country is so poor, they don't have the funding. But I think I'd be better off funding a sporting event or asking people to renovate the opera house than trying to help their children have a healthier future. It's very, very tough somehow to get that story across to Americans who are very privileged and probably don't really see the impact of climate change the way the little kids do in Madagascar because the monsoons are coming and the droughts are much more dire. So we, we do have a very difficult communication problem on our hands that our kids will pay the price for. 
And it's that immediate, isn't it? I mean, you're talking about 3% of the forest left right. in Madagascar. And when you say our kids are going to pay for it, you're not talking about our grandkids and our great grandkids and our great, well, you're talking about now, right? Our, our kids and our grandkids, obviously our grandkids will be really very, very upset and not have much of a life at all. But I think, you know, we all know the impacts and the cost that it's starting to take on Florida. People trying to spend millions of dollars to build walls in Miami or obviously struggle to pay insurance prices along the coast, which obviously are probably impossible to cover. Um, so we are seeing many, many of the impacts, but we're like little ostriches, I guess, with our heads in the sand. And it really scares me a lot because you know, to save the forests of Madagascar, you might say, oh, that's very far away, but they have lemurs and thousands of insects that have medicinal values that aren't found anywhere else in the world. And every country will cost us tons of money the same way every state will cost our government tons of money if we can't work as a group, if we can't make this a planetary effort. We certainly can't build fortresses around the few wealthy people that might be able to afford to ameliorate climate change. We, we're in this as a planet, as a whole. I had the privilege several months ago of talking to Dr. Terry Root, Nobel Prize winner on climate change. She, she won that with Al Gore. And she built such an important case in my mind about the immediacy and some of the things we can all do individually right now. Obviously, there's the funding issue you brought up. But what are some of the other things we can all do to preserve trees and, most importantly, perhaps those lemurs with medicinal values and other insects? Well, easily we can insist that people don't cut down big trees in their neighborhoods, everywhere from Turtle Rock to Sarasota County to writing the governor and say, please make a strong tree ordinance. They are like bricks of gold. They are our senior citizens, our most valuable nature residents. And yet willy nilly, we cut them down to build a garage or expand our home or widen a road. And yet there are so many other solutions that could be done to keep those big trees. Planting little trees is no substitute for big trees. And unfortunately, we're letting a lot of developers get away with that exchange, and it's not really a good case. Planting trees is great. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but we need to educate our kids. We need to educate our policymakers. Oh, I wish someone could mail my book to every person in Tallahassee that's making a decision about anything to do with human health because they would immediately see how important trees are. We need to advance policies in other countries. There are places that have plenty of funding like the U.S. to keep their forests healthy if we only would, and yet there are countries like Madagascar and Ethiopia that don't have the funds and they are seeing the brunt of climate change first. And so we really need to reach out to them as a humanitarian effort, mostly on behalf of our own kids as well as the kids there. So that's great. Shopping is another huge issue. We can be such careful consumers not to buy things that have products where the rainforest was cut down to grow them. That would include palm oil from Malaysia and Indonesia. That would include coffee from Brazil. That would include beef and soy from Brazil and other South American countries. Just a little bit of effort and we could insist that stores like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and Publix put labels on products so you know exactly where your soy is coming from and then you can make a very well-informed choice to not allow those terrible habits to form. So it's not soy or not soy, it's really knowing the global culture and which countries are being better stewards of our land? Well, it's knowing which, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure it's the countries, but it's Americans affording the consumer market is driven by those who pay the most money for products. And because we pay so much for everything and buy more, including things like clothing that's not very sustain sustainably created, we end up having a responsibility. We just can't let the rest of the world go to pot, so to speak, because we are insisting on consuming much more than our share of the global resources. Let's go back to planting the trees for a minute. When I heard you speak recently, I think you gave a wonderful example of, well, it's great that we're gonna plant trees, but 
the benefits we would have from these trees is like 70, 80 years out. Yes. More? Absolutely. In the rainforest, it's probably a thousand years out. When you think about a cleared tropical rainforest, A, you have to plant the trees. B, a lot of the big trees only grow in the shade of the initial trees. And that could be a hundred years from their starting point. And C, then you've got to bring back all those orchids and orchid pollinators and pollinators of the flowers of the trees and birds that eat the pollinators. I mean, where is this house of biodiversity that won't even be there if the forest has been cleared? So it's almost impossible really to recreate those forests. We may be able to grow back some material. We can grow back a lot of invasive species and fast growing trees that we don't necessarily want for timber and that definitely don't support all of those very special species like sloths and koalas and lemurs and other things. So we just need to be really careful about our information and know that replacing those forests is not like in the U.S. where, believe it or not, Grace, we cut down about 97% of our forests in America, but because we're temperate with very simple forests that have eight to 10 species on the whole of canopy tree, um, it was quite easy to replant them. And in a hundred years, they grew back quite nicely. We also have great soil from the glaciers that were here millions of years ago. In the tropics, the soil is very poor. Uh, the rainfall patterns are now very erratic because of climate change. So recreating and restoring forests in tropical rainforests is getting very, very tough. It's such a complex subject, so I'm so glad you're here sharing parts of this with us today. Let's talk about the canopies, because this has become a way that you really share the story. Talk about your work in canopy walks. I will. And you know, my, Florida takes a lot of credit for this. Mayaka River State Park has a canopy walkway that was the first public canopy walk in North America. And I built that because community members gave small dollars of money. It was all built by the community. Every board has a plank that somebody purchased. And so it's a real show of kind of love and caring by our community. And over time, um, the you know tourist industry has calculated that it brings in about a half a million visitors a year. That's worth about $30 million a year to the community. And it suddenly dawned on me that ecotourism is a better way for local people to make money than cutting down the forests. <coughs> Excuse me. So suddenly I found myself founding a new project called Mission Green, where why don't we build canopy walkways in the 10 most urgently destroyed forests of the world, hand those over to the local people to develop the ecotourism, train them, coach them, give them the best practices that we've already established here in the Western countries, and then allow them the benefit of making a sustainable income from these canopy walkways. So we have a great success in Malaysia. We have funded one there 100%. We have one in the Redwoods of California, another very endangered forest right now, admittedly because of fires and climate change. We're trying to fund a million dollars in Madagascar to build a walkway there because so many things live there that are found nowhere else in the world. And um, I would beg and borrow if anybody who is interested in their children or their grandchildren help me achieve this goal because it's really, really important. And then we will be funding a walkway in Mozambique, another one in India. But the bottom line here is that ecotourism can get people to the forest, take them into the canopy, which is sexy and fun and wonderfully exciting, educate them so they come home as ambassadors and best of all give local people an industry which is you know everything from bird watching tours to chefs at restaurants to having hotels nearby and um, this seems to be so much better than cutting down the trees for a one-time profit which is so tempting to these poor people in peru or madagascar when they don't really understand the global economy so this is the purpose of mission green it's an offshoot of our little tree foundation a sarasota based environmental foundation that we use to build the mayaka walkway and we use now to do school programs all over the world and try to educate kids and adults about the value of big trees so thank you. So I want to talk about quickly two of your books, The Arbonaut 
book, which is fascinating, uh, a good read, very educational. But I have to tell you, I just love Belief Detective. Yeah, that was, you know, a, a children's author approached me to come to the Amazon on one of my citizen science trips. Over the years, I think I've taken hundreds of Sarasotans to the Amazon. And so she came along and took notes and came back and wrote that darling children's book called The Leaf Detective, which just came out last year. And it is fabulous. Um, so side by side, she's actually giving 20% of her proceeds to Mission Green to funding that walkway in Madagascar, which is fantastic. Um, so I would love everyone to read it. And then if you want a little more of the, you know, woman in science story, um, which has been for me such a hurdle, and also the challenges of discovery and working around the world in the tops of trees. My book, The Arbor Knot, is my own memoir to try to share my, as I call them, misadventures with young people who might be contemplating a career in science or young parents who are struggling to juggle work and um, career, which was a lot of what I had to do at the time. Both of them are excellent reads. I, I value both of them and I thank you for both of them. Where can people find out more about you and your work, Meg? So I have a website, canopymeg.com. Uh, we have treefoundation.org, our local foundation. And we've actually just developed a, a really beautiful website, mission slash green.org, so that people can learn specifically about ways they can help us save these 10 most important forests of the world. Meg, thank you for being on my show today, for also sharing the Earth's story. I hope you'll come back. I'd love to talk to you more about women in science. That would be a wonderful conversation for us to have. So thank you for being Fantastic. with us today. Thank you so much for the trees. <laughs> Absolutely. This is Grace Salmon, and this is a copyrighted episode by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air, Global Radio Network. Thanks for being with us. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon.